to everyone. I am so happy to be here again with you. So this evening, you all know that we are here to see, to listen to John Herschel. I know that most of you already know him and many of you know a lot about him, but I think you know that he went to Penn State, but he was drafted by the Ravens. And I believe he played for four seasons with the Ravens. And he left the Ravens and went back to school so that he could work on, finish working on his doctorate degree. And I believe that in the middle of the pandemic, Mr. Urschel became Dr. Urschel. So we now have with us Dr. Urschel, who is going to, who now also has a book that you're all going to receive. And I think you'll be excited about receiving this book from this doctor, Dr. Former football player, which is really confusing, but I'm sure that you all understand that. And without me saying another word, or oh, he's going to speak. And after he finishes speaking, then we'll go to the questions that you ask, and you'll have a chance to ask the questions that you said. I turn this now over to Dr. Herschel. Thank you, Dr. Dr. Hirsch. Thank you for that kind uh, introduction. First, I'm going to share a screen. I have uh, I have some slides. The format for this is uh, is pretty straightforward. First, I ju would just like to tell you a little bit about myself, tell you a little bit about football, but mainly talk about how I got into math, sort of my path into mathematics, and what it is I do these days. And lastly, why math is important not just for me but for you. And then the, uh, the second half of this will be sort of opening this up to you all to sort of ask me questions and for me to sort of like answer whatever's on your mind and try to be a resource for you all. So I have to say that uh, it's a little startling to hear myself sort of described so generously in that uh, sort of, I don't spend a lot of time thinking about the ways in which I'm unique. My life is sort of the only one I know. It's sort of normal to me. But I do recognize I'm very lucky, first, to have had a chance to pursue my dream of being a professional football player, but also to be able to pursue my dream of being a mathematician. And, you know, I've gotten a lot of attention for being a football player because, well, football players get lots of attention. But I think my more interesting story is my story about the story of me sort of moving towards mathematics. And that's really what I'd like to focus on. And this story doesn't really begin with me, but my mother. I inherited my sort of love of math from my mom, along with my height, my stubbornness, and a few other things. And growing up, my mom was actually quite a talented math student. And she, uh, she wanted to go into some sort of mathematical field, but she, uh, she didn't think it was possible. Her, uh, her parents, my grandmother pictured there, my grandfather, neither of them ever graduated from high school. My uh, grandmother attended school in the basement of a local black church where sort of one teacher taught all the students, no matter their age, school ended after eighth grade. Both my uh, grandfather and grandmother ended up in Cincinnati where my uh, grandmother worked as a seamstress and my grandfather worked two jobs the morning shift at a linen and uniform supply company and the afternoon shift at General Motors. My, uh, my mom attended a public school where the goal was just to graduate, not to sort of expand a student's mind. This was a school with a high dropout rate, but my mom was a really talented math student. And thankfully she had a couple of teachers who recognized it. They let her take classes above her grade level. By the time she entered her senior year, she had taken all the math classes they could offer at her school. And so one teacher helped her enroll in college courses at the University of Cincinnati, her local university. But that was sort of the limit of the encouragement that she got. Even when she uh, talked to her guidance counselor, the guidance counselor told her to forget going to college and that she should focus on something more attainable, like uh, being a secretary. Well, it took a lot of courage for her to not listen to this person. And I'm quite glad she did. She applied to the University of Cincinnati, her local university, got in and got a full scholarship. And uh, there she, uh, she thought she wanted to pursue some mathematical field, maybe 
uh, engineering or something related. But when she got there, she sort of experienced something. When other people looked at her, they didn't see a doctor, they didn't see an astrophysicist. They saw a young black woman from a rough part of town. So she started to doubt herself too. She felt like she wasn't prepared enough. She wondered whether she was smart enough and she needed a job. So she became a nurse and she worked as a nurse at night in the operating room while putting herself through grad school. She and my dad separated when I was uh, quite young and my father moved back to Canada. And uh, my mother as a single mother sort of knew all too well sort of the world could be a difficult place. But here's a really interesting thing. She made sure that sort of like I, as her son, never felt this way, never felt this way at all. She made sure that no matter what I wanted to do, no matter what I wanted to be, that I never felt like any of my dreams were out of reach. She made sure I never felt like the household I grew up in affected what kind of opportunities I got. And uh, I have to say, by and large, she succeeded. At home, she noticed I had a talent and an interest in math, and she encouraged it. I would devour workbooks that she would get me. I would sort of like play these games. I would just do puzzles at home, sort of like day after day after day. Puzzles like uh, some of the ones I have here on the slide. For instance, I would love doing these uh, sort of like magic sum puzzles where some numbers are filled in and every row, column, and diagonal sums up to a fixed number. So here it's 15. And uh, on the right, a magic product. Same idea, except you multiply numbers in every row or column or diagonal, and they have to multiply for 216. I would spend hours at the kitchen playing Sudoku or board games, games that were developing my sort of my reasoning, my quantitative thinking, my analytical skills, not to mention my competitive instincts, sort of losing physically pained me in some sense. And she, you know, she would give me puzzle book after puzzle book. And here's where I really started to sort of glimpse the potential and the beauty of math. I, I love these puzzle books. I could spend sort of like hours on them, sitting at my little desk, not even noticing time passing. And uh, to me, I especially loved logic puzzles. They were sort of a game, detective stories, or like a treasure hunt. Given a bunch of clues, I would have to deduce a conclusion. And uh, I have to say, I would never really read the lessons at the start of the section or the instructions for completing the problems. I wanted to figure it out for myself. And I have to say, looking back, I realized when I was doing those logic puzzles as a kid, I was training my mind. I was learning how to separate variables, sort of recognize patterns, identify relevant information, and create my own tools and techniques for solving problems. And these are skills that have served me extremely well in my life, not just as a mathematician. I have to say, though, when I got to high school, math and science were still my favorite classes, but I wasn't as interested in them as I used to be. I didn't really sort of like want to do math all day. I wanted to play football. Well, what happened? On one level, it's pretty obvious. Sports are fun, and I sort of craved this sort of competition and the adrenaline and the challenge. I made my best friends in the world through football, and sports can be hard, sometimes even painful, but my teammates and I, we would share that challenge, we would share that pain, and we had a common goal. And of course, sort of as a society, sports are a common culture. When a kid sort of turns on the TV, he or she sees sort of athletes, not mathematicians. They sort of see how desirable it is to be an NFL player or let's say an NFL or an NBA star. And in fact, if you have any athletic talent at all, when you're a kid, people are going to encourage it. I had coaches in my ear motivating me to do you know, one more rep in the weight room when I thought I was done. I had sort of the example of teammates next to me sort of putting it on the line. Strangers would come up and encourage me. They would cheer for me, sort of strangers. I'm not talking about the NFL, I'm talking about high school. Needless to say, you know, I didn't have math teachers coaxing one more problem out of me. They weren't calling the Princeton math department and telling them to recruit me the way my high school football coach was calling the Princeton football coach. I didn't have any public mathematicians to inspire me or for me to want to emulate. 
I actually didn't even know what a mathematician was or what a mathematician did. And then I got to Penn State. My mom's plan for me was to be a rocket scientist. I wasn't thinking too much about it at first. I was, I was really sort of more concerned with proving myself on the football field. Sort of being a Big Ten offensive lineman was a dream of mine since I was uh, a little kid. And to be honest, my engineering classes, they sort of bored me a little bit. I, they kept focusing on how things worked, which is an important question, but I kept finding myself coming back to the question of why. I didn't want to memorize formulas. I wanted to know how they came up with them in the first place. And as soon as I started taking college math classes, something shifted. Everybody thinks Penn State is a football school and you know, with good reason. Beaver Stadium fits over 100,000 people. And I have to say, I'm sort of convinced we have the best fans in the world. But what most people don't know is Penn State also has a good math department. I took a few math classes and I sort of felt something in me come alive. In them. There is sort of a beauty and rigor to math that I loved. It could be sort of difficult, even frustrating. Don't get me wrong, but beneath the complexity of math, there's a clarity. And here I realized was where I could ask that question, the question of why and where I could find answers. And what was even more exciting was that some of those answers were ones that no one had ever found before. During my sophomore year in college, I, uh, I had a professor, a guy by the name of Vadim Kaloshin. He's, uh, he's a professor at University of Maryland now. He was a brilliant mathematician, one of the top experts in the world on something called dynamical systems, which are systems that change states over time. Think, think the weather. One day, Kaloshin summoned me to his office and gave me this book, Chaos, an Introduction to Dynamical Systems. He pointed out a challenge at the end of the first chapter, period three implies chaos, and he asked me if I could solve it. At the time, I had only taken basic physics and a few advanced math classes, and this was a graduate textbook. And so to solve this problem, I had to start at the very beginning, not the beginning of the book, but the beginning of the topic. For the entire next week, I spent every spare moment I had trying to catch up. I would read while lying in bed very early, reading late at night, reading while eating at meals, reading while hanging out with my friends while they played video games. Basically any moment I wasn't in class on the practice field or studying tape, I was trying to solve this problem. After a week of steady work, I was able to produce the proof and I brought it to Kaloshin. Then he suggested another book, even more complicated one. And I checked it out of the library and started reading it. And this would go on for a while. Then he started to give me a few papers to start reading, some math papers related to a particular problem known as the three body problem. And he said he had a couple graduate students working on it, but one pulled out and he, uh, he asked if I wanted to take on mathematical research. I said yes, and this changed my life. I can assure you as a high school student, this is not what I thought I was gonna spend my free time in college doing, reading math books, working on a problem about outer space. During the bowl game that year, we went to the uh, Outback Bowl. I would read this math book on the way to and from practice. When other people were going out to, well, you know, going out for extracurricular activities, I was in a coffee shop, glued to my book, trying to figure out just one more thing, excited to read one more page. Eventually, after many months of hard work, we came up with a result, one that was worth publishing. Our aim was to study the dynamics of a Sun-Jupiter asteroid system and show the existence of instabilities in the movement of an asteroid. And we were successful. We were able to show that an asteroid whose initial orbit is far from the orbit of Mars can be generally perturbed into one that crosses Mars's orbit. It was a problem in celestial mechanics. And what excited me wasn't discovering something new about the physical universe. I didn't find Mars inherently interesting. What excited me was the idea of discovering something new. 
no one had ever proven what we had just shown. And this sort of like sparked my uh, competitive instincts in some sense. There were so many unanswered questions, sort of a whole theoretical universe to understand. And it was that moment right then that I knew I wanted to become a mathematician. When I was a teenager, I had a lot of aggression. and I sort of loved the feeling I got when I was blocking during football games. I sort of craved this physical challenge. And frankly, I just sort of loved running around on the football field and hitting people. And I just, I didn't know any feeling like it. And I have to say that feeling that mathematical research gave me was sort of as thrilling and unmatchable, if not more so, but in a different way. The challenge of sort of solving an open problem a difficult sort of attempt to sort of master high level concepts and to sort of like make connections and map new territories of understanding, it's, there's nothing like it. And the beauty of it is that there's a rigor to it. Anytime I would try to sort of make a claim, I had to understand every step of a solution or the whole thing would fall apart. I would have to prove it. And well, since that first research paper, a lot's happened. I uh, I did indeed get drafted into the NFL and I played three years for the Baltimore Ravens. While playing in the NFL, I have to say, I again felt this sort of pull of math. I was uh, playing the first year of my, in the league, playing for the Ravens and doing well, but not being in a uh, sort of, and in a university, not sort of taking classes, not reading academic papers, not talking to people. This, uh, this got to me a little bit. And I yeah. apply to uh, MIT for a PhD in math after my first year in the league. And I have to say that, uh, well, I'm finishing up my PhD now. And uh, next year, I'll be starting a uh, postdoctoral position at uh, Princeton. but. During my time at MIT, I sort of fell in love with math even more. Being at a place full of sort of such talented individuals who just love math and love talking about these things, there's, uh, there's really nothing like it. And I have to say that uh, so while at MIT, I realized sort of all the amazing things you can do with math. And so what I'd like to do is sort of give you a little brief introduction into the sort of things I do with math these days. So these days I work on something uh, called linear algebra, which for middle school students, these uh, symbols, these X's and these Y's might look a little abstract, but for high school students who have taken algebra, I have a uh, two by two system of linear equations, two X plus three Y equals 16, X plus Y equals seven, and perhaps you want to solve for x and y. Well, in algebra, they teach you how to do this. But uh, more generally, you can think about systems of linear equations as these sort of large arrays that you can sort of solve rather than thinking about two equations and two unknown. Maybe you need to solve a problem with a billion equations and a billion unknowns. And well, we can't do this by hand, and we have to rely on computers. And this area of linear algebra is fundamentally concerned with solving two types of equations, linear systems, which are sort of generalizations of what I just showed you, and eigenvalue problems, which given an array of numbers can tell you something about how those numbers behave. And uh, these sort of problems actually show up in a wide range of applications. So maybe you're interested in uh, things like differential equations. Maybe you wanna be an engineer. Well. It turns out that in practice, if you're an engineer and you want to solve something like a heat equation, well, in practice, you often can't solve this problem by hand and you need to make use of some sort of discretization, which leads you to a linear system, which leads you to me. Or maybe you're into uh, data science and you uh, want to take you know, big data sets and try to make some conclusions from them. Well, then something useful to, for you might be something called principal component analysis, where you take a large data set and uh, you compute something called eigenvalues 
of uh, some representation of that data set, which tells you things about your data. And so this is just a little sort of, sort of a basic view of the sort of things that I work on while I'm at MIT and how these things might connect to sort of subjects you know, like engineering or data science. And you don't have to be sort of a researcher in math to know how important math is. So uh, I like, uh, I have to say, I'm a big fan of these XKCD comics and making use of them. And so a more general question is, why does math matter for you? Well, suppose you want to be a scientist of some sort. Suppose you want to be a biologist, a chemist, a physicist, an engineer. It turns out that, uh, well, surprise, surprise, math is sort of the foundation of all these things because math is sort of the language of sort of talking quantitatively. And so it's quite hard to do things in biology or chemistry or physics if you don't have sort of like a strong basic foundation in math. And uh, more generally, suppose you're interested in uh, you know, being a data scientist, or suppose you're just interested in making good sort of well-reasoned decisions. It turns out that, you know, to the surprise of perhaps no one, numbers remain the best system for determining which of two things are larger, or you can think more generally, quantitative reasoning sort of remains one of the best ways to try to make a decision. For instance, mathematical concepts that can help you in your daily life are things like understanding the difference between correlation and causation. Understanding how to read sort of like some statistic that you might see in the newspaper how to understand what they're really saying, how to read a bar plot, a pie chart, how to sort of take in statistics and really sort of think to yourself, is this saying what I actually think it's saying or am I being misled? And I can tell you that if you don't have a strong, strong foundation in math, you're much more likely to be misled by sort of false information. And I hope that sort of from this sort of like introductory presentation, I hope you sort of take something from this. Maybe you can connect personally to my experiences about, you know, sort of maybe you aspire to be a scientist or you aspire to be, you know, to do something in STEM. Or maybe you've realized that the world we live in is an increasingly quantitative one. It isn't just sort of like, mathematics isn't just beautiful or interesting. In my opinion, mathematics isn't just a powerful practical tool. Math is a necessary one. That's all I have for you all, but I hear you have some questions for me. And if you think up any questions from sort of what I showed you now, I think once you get through the prepared questions, feel free to uh, ask me any additional questions that come to mind. Dr. Herschel, we did have a question or a few questions from questions from Christian Hill. Christian, would you like to ask the questions that you sent in? Um, <clears throat> I was just wondering um, why you wanted to play football over math and um, why you chose the Ravens. Yeah, yeah, of course. So, uh, yes, when I was younger, I definitely, I can definitely say that. Uh, I really was focused on math more than football for a time. And I think, I think that reason is sort of pretty straightforward. Like, like sort of football is fundamentally fun in some sense. Like, yes, it's challenging. Yes, it's hard. Yes, it's like in many ways quite violent, but in some sense, it's really fun. And math, at least for me, when I was in high school and in middle school, Math class, at least, wasn't always the most fun for me. And the best way I can sort of describe it is I found myself just sort of based off my upbringing as a kid, I found myself always interested in puzzles, always interested in trying to sort of figure out the answer to this question of why, or sort of like understand how something worked. And I found that, especially in the math classes that I took in middle school and high school, 
there was a much bigger focus on here's the equation, here's the formula, here's the sort of quote unquote algorithm or the set of steps you need to do to solve a certain problem to sort of like do a certain task, whether it's like memorizing the quadratic formula sort of doing it 20 times on the homework, two times on the quiz, and then once on the test, and then moving on. This sort of like didn't really interest me so much. And I found myself always more interested in the questions of, why is this formula true? How do we know it's true? And trying to use formulas that maybe I knew or learned and use them to solve interesting or challenging problems where it's not just uh, me sort of repeating what a teacher showed me how to do. But I really enjoyed when I got to sort of use things I learned and use them critically to solve sort of new problems that uh, maybe aren't so easy to solve. And so I can say that that's sort of why I think I liked football more when I was younger. And uh, as I got older, I would say that my experiences with math have been sort of more and more positive. Like taking college math, I sort of came to realize that math is so much more than just like memorizing formulas and just like, you know, regurgitating things. It's really about sort of active original thought and sort of trying to solve tough problems using this beautiful quantitative language that is math. And uh, for why I sort of chose to play for the Ravens, I have to say, I. Uh, I did not get a choice in the matter. I was uh, drafted. And so that means that uh, whichever team decides to take me, that is where I go. Although I do have to say, I was quite happy and quite lucky to be drafted by the Ravens because my mother at the time actually lived in uh, sort of South Baltimore. And so uh, I had a, I already had a connection built in. Although I do have to say the majority, I went to Penn State and so the majority of my friends are sort of like Steelers fans. And so the Ravens were actually the one team sort of pre-draft where everyone said, John, we love you. We're going to support you. We're going to buy your jersey. We're going to go like to games wherever you go, unless you go to Baltimore. And uh, that is exactly where I ended up. So, <laughs> Oh, that is so funny. Uh, Tyva, you had two questions that you sent in. Um, do you, would you like to unmute yourself and ask those questions now? Thank you. Yeah. So although you were studying math somewhat alongside playing football, would you say being an NFL star helped you in the world of math and with creating connections with other mathematicians? Or do people in that field not really care about the NFL history and just focus on your abilities and skills as a mathematician? That's a great question. So I have to say early on in my math career, I, uh, I do think being a football player was a uh, sort of net negative in the sense that uh, I do remember sort of early on in my career, you know, I would go somewhere to give a talk or you know, I would talk to someone mathematically and they would assume that I wasn't very good at math or I wasn't as good at math as like people thought I was and that it was just like, I'm just a football player and sort of like being good at math for a football player, they sort of thought was a very low standard. And so like, is this person actually good at math? Sort of, we don't know. And so I got a lot of sort of like, not so nice comments early on in my career. But uh, the one thing that was pretty uniform is, you know, maybe I would go somewhere and I would get a not so nice comment. Then I, I'm there to give a math talk. Then I give my math presentation and sort of always sort of like uniformly by the end, they have eaten their words and sort of like, I sort of early on sort of took that personally. And I like to like prove people wrong and say, no, like, look at my math, look at the work I'm doing. I'm a strong mathematician just by mathematician standards. And uh, I can say that these days it's a, it's a mild net positive. I think that uh, people think it's cool but uh, most mathematicians don't know much about American football and don't know much about the NFL. And so it's sort of a side note that they think, oh, that's kind of cool, but no one, I don't think anyone really cares that much, at least in math. That's nice. So once you knew you wanted to leave the NFL, how much courage did it actually take to follow through on that decision? That took some time. I, uh, I have to say, 
that was sort of at the time one of the tougher decisions. I was uh, sort of thinking about this all off season and sort of trying to decide: do I play one more season? Do I play no more seasons? And uh, it was a tough decision, in part because I still very much loved football, but also sort of that was actually the time right around when I became a father, which slightly shifted my priorities, and also sort of around the time where my uh, career sort of at MIT started to sort of become more serious. I was getting later in my PhD and it was getting to the point where sort of more time there could translate into sort of like a more successful mathematical career. And I sort of knew that sort of like, yes, playing in the NFL has sort of been amazing. I, uh, I was vested, I got my pension, but uh, doing math was sort of what I wanted to do sort of like until I'm very old. So in hindsight, I made the correct decision and it shouldn't have been such a difficult decision, but at the time I had a quite a tough time making the decision. So given how things have turned out sort of like mathematically for me, I'm very happy that I put the extra time into that. Thank you. Also very random, but I like your door. Oh, thank you. So it's, uh, yeah, those are yeah some hexagons and it's, uh, so this is a new place that we just moved into, but I inherited soundproofing on this door and a wall which you can't see from the previous tenants and so uh, yeah, it's quite helpful my daughter's three almost four and uh she can be quite loud sometimes so i'm very thankful to inherit the soundproofing all right thank you thank you so much for those questions now we also have uh three questions coming from atoya ill atoya Oh, um, she's our mom. Yeah, she's our mom. So are these, so are these more questions from you? From Desiree. 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 Okay. Mm -hmm. okay, do you want to ask those, the other, the additional questions? Do I, I would remember? mind asking. Are you okay? You don't have any additional questions? Oh, I do have questions. Um, yeah, I can hold them up. Okay, so my first question is what, who or what inspired you to like go into like um, mathematics other than football? So did you say the end of that? You said who inspired me to go into mathematics? Yes. Okay, so uh, yes. So it was actually, it was this professor I was talking about. It's this professor, this guy, Vadim Koloshin, who uh, he taught this college class I took my sophomore year. It's uh, the class was called uh, I think an introduction to real analysis, which for you all, you should think of like, it's sort of like the first math class you take in college, which is past like engineering type math. And this class was pretty much all about taking like things we learn in calculus and making sure that it's all true. Like not just taking things for granted, but making sure like everything actually works. And I had this class and, uh, I was doing quite well in the class. I really liked the class, but you know, I was a sort of quiet student and he actually actively reached out to me. He sort of like, sort of pinpointed me and told me to stay after class. And then he told me to come see him in his office, which like already I was like, why, why do I need to come see you in your office? Like, am I in trouble? And then he sort of told me, he thought like I was extremely talented in math. He thought like I had a lot of potential. And he sort of like nice. asked if I was open to sort of like additional work or additional reading outside of class. And like, I, I jumped at this. And so this is when he gave me this book to read with this challenge. I spent a week on it, like nonstop. I eventually managed to solve it. I like, I was so proud of myself at the time. I gave him the solution and he was, he was happy. And then he just gave me three more problems to do. And this like sort of like went on and on. He would send me problems. And I would solve them and send the solutions and he would just give me more and more problems and sort of him believing in me mathematically just like meant the meant the world to me and uh, so he was a huge inspiration to me and also I just really enjoyed sort of solving math problems the sort of the thing I think about when I think back on this experience with this uh, professor of the dean this is actually, this relates a lot to why sort of, why I try to spend some like 
decent freshman. Okay, of course, you know, I have a full-time job sort of being a mathematician, doing research, teaching courses for my university, but this is why I do try to spend like a decent amount of my time sort of like helping and inspiring sort of the younger generation of scientists and mathematicians, whether it's through sort of like advising undergraduates at MIT or uh, for instance, I'm running a camp at uh, MIT Math right now called Math Roots, which we're in the middle of right now, which is quite fun. And we're just coming to see you all. I sort of realized that this professor, the Dean, helping me or sort of spending time with me, giving me these problems to solve or spending time where I come to his office and I talk about solutions or giving me this research project does nothing for him. Like nothing that like he did for me benefits him. It actively takes time away from him doing research. That research paper I told you about that I published, he helped me so much with that that he even put his name on it. And so sort of like that, he's someone who has really had a profound impact on me and who's also impacted sort of like how I view sort of the responsibility of a mathematician to sort of bring along the sort of younger generation of scientists in whatever form sort of like we can. And so, yeah. Awesome. We have, um, sorry, Dr. Smith, I want to make sure I grab the ones that are asking questions in our chat. Okay. So, um, first, Alexandra, you can ask your question, and then Grayson, you can go second. Actually, can I can I respond to one of the questions in the chat that I see that sort of like? Yeah, so that's the first. The, those Alexandra, she asked the question in the chat, and Grayson. Um, I want to actually address uh, your question. So this question of, uh, so there's a question in the chat that says, I'm obviously gifted at math, but what do I say to the student who is really interested, but may not be gifted? And I think this is a really good question. And first of all, I want to stress that you don't have to be like the best person at math in your class to enjoy math, to get something out of math, and to also sort of like let math be something that like enriches your life. Not everyone's going to be a mathematician, not everyone's going to be a scientist, but I think it's important to take some of the sort of like tools of sort of mathematical thinking or quantitative thinking and remember these things because these things are gonna help you sort of throughout your life when you have to make quantitative decisions or when you have to take in information and decide what you wanted to do. And uh, the last part of that question I wanna sort of tackle, so to speak, is this, I'm obviously gifted at math part, because I think in some ways, I think it's not as obvious as everyone makes it out to be. And what I mean by that is, I feel like we as a society have sort of been conditioned when we think about like mathematicians or physicists or whatever it may be, we're conditioned to think that these like top mathematicians are these brilliant genius babies. You know, you think of like, you know, you think like John Nash or like Beautiful Mind, these movies that we see. These brilliant geniuses, the only challenges they face in life are people not understanding their genius or people like holding back their genius. But we never see any like base, we never see any of them sort of like struggling because they had to work very hard to get very good at math and they had to sort of like do all these things and I would say that what I've noticed by looking at sort of like, who are the best mathematicians in the world? Who are the best physicists in the world? I would say, yes, talent plays a role. I think if I said that talent had nothing to do with it, I'd be just flat out lying. But the thing that I think plays so much of a bigger role than talent is opportunity. I've noticed that uh, what really makes the difference in sort of like being a successful mathematician or a physicist or wherever it may be, you don't have to be a one in a million talent. In my opinion, you're much more likely to sort of be incredibly successful in math if you're, let's say, a one in 100 talent or a one in 50 talent and sort of like a one in like 
10,000 opportunity than a one in 10,000 sort of talent, but like you don't have much opportunity, you don't have res you don't have access to sort of like high quality mathematical resources. And so I think that like, yes, talent plays a role, but this sort of concept of genius in math is in many ways sort of made by sort of the opportunities you have. All right, I didn't mean to get us off our track of uh, questions that you have, but I saw that. No, it's okay, that's great. It was a great question. Um, Alexandria, would you like to ask your question? Or Grayson? Um, so I was wondering um, if you do the um, same math that, um, Katherine Johnson did? Good question. Believe it or not, the answer is yes. Yes, I do. Yes, I do in a, in a sort of very straightforward way. So what Katherine Johnson did, which, okay, this isn't everything she did, but one of the things she did was sort of help calculate the trajectory of certain objects sort of being sort of like shot up. And the way she did this was through sort of like uh, a field which we sort of now call numerical analysis. The idea is that she's trying to sort of model this complicated procedure using equations, but she knows that these equations aren't exactly perfect. And so she's trying to recognize that she can't solve this problem completely exactly because it's too complicated, but she's trying to sort of like almost solve this problem and make sure that the error is like small enough that it's not going to make a difference. And uh, this is like a lot of the work she did can be considered like sub areas of something called numerical analysis. And so this is also an area that I do a lot of work in. So yes, in many ways, like a lot of the tools and techniques that she used back then are things that I learned and that like sometimes I use in my path. Hi, I have a question. Hi, Matilda. I have a question. Your question. Hi, how are you? I'm doing um, well. I was wondering, I know you probably already answered this. What really pulled you from leaving the MBA to going to being a mathematician? Like, what really made you fall in love with math? Because I need to. Yeah, so uh, yes, from the uh, NFL, but this is, this is close. Uh, yeah, I would say the main thing is uh, so, one, I mentioned having a child sort of changes things, sort of changes priorities somewhat. And then the other big thing is that uh, sort of like the more time I spent at MIT, sort of like more and more, I fell in love with mathematics and I realized that sort of my like life's passion sort of like from now until like, I'm like old, old, like 60, 70, is to do math, to like sort of solve tough math problems that sort of like when I solve them, this can like actually improve our lives in some way, shape or form. And also to sort of like teach math and to like mentor like undergraduate students in particular and try to inspire young people to sort of like, you know, become scientists or whatever sort of discipline they may, may want to go into. Out of all the science fields, I know like you said math really far to fall in love with it, but like, was there like a teacher or was there like a phrase or like what really like made you fall in love was it like a like I'm really know it's like because of math but it's like did a teacher show you your ways or was it like like how did you really fall in love is what I meant to say like did a teacher help you out along the way or did you like parents helped you out like what really caused you to fall in love yeah I would say it's a combination of so of course you know I've, I've talked about this professor I had in college who really sort of like you know, showed me that I could be successful in math. But I think really, I think I've always been in love with math. I just didn't know it. I just, like, even when I was little, I loved, I just loved solving puzzles. And yes, you don't have to, like, that doesn't always directly mean you have to do math. For instance, I think I could have just as easily become a physicist or, sort of a uh, economist or, you know, like a quantitative researcher or sort of a computer scientist. But I think the thing that sort of like kept me specifically in math was sort of this like experience with this professor. Although I think that 
when you think of, like when I call myself a mathematician in some sense, believe it or not, sort of being firmly rooted in math actually means you're kind of well prepared for everything in some sense. Like I am a mathematician. I am like, I sit in a math department, but I do computer science. I'm also a computer scientist. Like I, I publish papers in, you know, machine learning conferences. I, uh, I'm also sort of trained as an engineer in some sense in that, you know, I'm highly trained to solve, you know, certain sort of like numerical problems that engineers need to solve very often. And so I often talk a lot with engineers and I also talk with physicists because when physicists need, you know, a certain, uh, something called a differential equation solved, they often come to people like me. And so I would say that uh, I could have been a lot of things, but my professor had an impact on me. But I think the reason why I stayed in math but didn't, and didn't shift to sort of any other field is because I feel like it's a great sort of like home base for me to do what I want and for me to sort of decide what applications or what areas interest me. So these days, I mainly work on applications in computer science, but maybe sort of a decade from now or two decades from now, I decide I'm not so interested in that anymore. Maybe I want to think about physics. And I can do that because math is such a strong sort of central base that like you can easily jump into like a large number of different fields. And so that's something I'd like. I'm sorry, one more question. Um, were you always making good grades in math? Because like I make passing grades, but I never like. Is it good grades you make made in math through your school school age years? No, no, actually. So, in high school, I sort of always made good grades. But for instance, I remember in sixth grade, I don't know what was going on with me. I mean, so in sixth grade, so my dad like lived in sort of Canada, but at least he lived like a distance where I could like see him decently often. Right around like the start of middle school my dad actually moved quite far away and I don't know if I was acting out or what I was doing, but I, uh, I just like stopped doing my homework. I like stopped sort of like doing things. And uh, when I was in sixth grade, I failed home ec. Like, you know, you need to do like knitting and things like that. And I got a B in math because, okay, yes. That's better than me, I got a D. These things happen. But, uh, yeah, I got to be in math when I was in sixth grade. And this is sort of uh, my mom, when she saw my report card, yes, I failed home ec. She, uh, but she was more mad about that B in math. I can tell you something. She, that was, uh, that was not a pleasant experience. She was not happy with me. So she, uh, she set me straight. But uh, yeah, no, I, I didn't always get uh, A's in math and, you know, sometimes, you know, you go through things and uh, yeah. But from that point on, I, I did always get A's in math, but that was sort of because, I don't know, it just, uh, I felt like I had a good foundation. It always made sense to me. And I felt like I was always well prepared for the classes I was taking. Like they were, they were boring to some extent, but uh, like it was never like I stopped paying attention. So I stopped doing well sort of thing. But Grayson, I, yeah. So Dr. Smith, if I can just jump in, I just wanted to ask one question as well. So you told us before, um, historical, that you were on the bus reading your, your book and some of the other people on that bus were doing other things. Um, and I don't know how they felt about you studying versus doing the other things and that sort of peer pressure that a lot of the kids probably feel when they want to devote their time to studying and the kids around them may not want to I just wanted to know your feelings about dealing with that and working yeah, through that. that's a great question so I don't know so much about middle school or high school but I can say that and this is sort of maybe a lesson for what's to come when like when you think about like college football players we're we're serious athletes and uh you know if i'm reading a book on the way to practice and from practice like people might say something about it or like sort of like think it's interesting no one's making fun of me about this no one is sort of like giving me a hard time about this when i'm sort of like in the hotel sort of studying and doing things when people are sort of going out at night no one's giving me a hard time about this i mean 
yes, I'm, I'm sort of like, I'm a student and I'm studying, but I'm also 100% a football player. And I'm sort of like 100% sort of like a part of the team and like also 100% not taking anything from anybody. It's sort of like no different than anybody else on the team. And so if anything, like I can say my sort of like teammates in college, they thought it was awesome that I was good at math. I mean, like I'd be reading on the bus and people would say like, John's built different sort of thing. And like, you know, John's gonna like, John's gonna like solve some big problems. You know, I would help all my teammates when they had to take math in college. Uh, yeah, no, but I was one of the guys. I mean, all my best friends in the world are primarily like guys I played football with in college. I mean, we're about that age where everyone's getting married and we're like, uh, you just see the same people at the weddings over and over again. You just like <laughs> rotate who's the best man, who's a groomsman, and who's just like. Ah! Yeah, no, it's. Uh-oh. I think when you're like truly a part of the team, these like little things that make you different, they're sort of like, they're actually positives. So I really quickly, I want to get um, Grayson's question and Mr. Jed. <laughs> Is that. Okay, I want to get their question, but I had a question quickly. I know a lot of this, the students on our call right now, they um, are in extracurricular activities, they're in sports, they're in other camps. So I wanted to know, how did you balance um, sports in school? If you played sports um, early on, like maybe middle school and high school, how did you um how did you balance it? Because I played sports in high school, soccer, lacrosse did cheerlead of gymnastics, but I remember I got an 80. My school did like actual numbers. It wasn't just like A, B, C, D. We did actual (laughs) numbers. And so I went down from an 89 to an 80 in physics. And my dad was super upset. Although it was a B, he was like, you barely made it, you know? And um, I always was in AP classes, advanced placement classes, and he made me sit out of my lacrosse game because he was like, you're a student athlete, student first, athlete second. And so I was just curious if you had any advice for the, you know, for the kids who are balancing doing both It's very important, you know, for your schooling and education to come first and then the sport. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, the thing that served me really well is, uh, so first of all, you have to recognize you have limited hours in the day. And so you have to make sure that you're not doing too much because there truly is a threshold of too much. Like as people, we just can't keep taking on more and more responsibilities without re- reaching like a threshold or a breaking point at some point. And I think it's important that we're honest with ourselves and we say that. Now, if you like you're doing things and you think you're not quite at that breaking point, but you're having trouble getting everything done, I'd say the most important thing to keep in mind is do the most important things first. So suppose, you know, you're me, you're playing football and you're in high school, you're sort of, you have a bunch of schoolwork. First thing in the morning, if you can, the things you should do first are things like football training. Like if you have to go lift weights at some time, I would, I always tried to like lift weights early in the morning, uh, work on your homework on the way to school, sort of like at lunchtime, try to like make use of that time to get something done. Maybe watching film or like working on some homework, make sure that you spend all of your free time during the day, like from when you wake up all the way through doing things you have to do for the things that are most important, which for me, let's say are math and football or school and football. Once I finish everything I have to do for that day, now I'm free. Now I can do fun things. Now I can relax. Maybe I watch TV. Maybe I play video games. Maybe I go somewhere with my friends. But the important thing is the things that have to get done should get done first. And that's sort of like the main thing that I did. And I think that sort of like helped me a lot. The one thing I should mention is I can't stay too far past six because I do have to get back the sort of other the camp I'm a part of. Okay, uh, Grayson, if you want to ans- answer a question really quickly. Did he sign on? Okay, maybe he signed off. Um, Ray, you can ask your question, sweetie. Okay, um, 
my question is, what was your goal when you were in high school football? And do you change your goal when you were in NFL? Yeah, that's a great question. So when I was in high school sort of football, my goal and actually my dream was always to be like an offensive lineman in the Big Ten. Like I grew up watching Michigan football. When I was in high school, like I want to be like Jake Long. So some, most of you are probably too young, but Jake Long was the left tackle for the Michigan Wolverines. And he was just this amazing football player. And I played left tackle in high school. And so that was really my dream. And so when Penn State offered me, I, I really jumped on it. And my like whole goal when I first got to Penn State was just to become a starter for Penn State and be like a starting offensive lineman in the Big Ten. And I can tell you, like one of the things I'm most proud of is I did become a starting offensive lineman in the Big Ten. I was like twice first team all Big Ten. I was an All-American and these things like were dreams come true. If anything, being in the NFL, playing in the NFL, this was like, this was really never a huge dream. And this was like icing on the cake. This was like sort of like more than I sort of ever could like hope or dream of. And uh, once I got to the NFL, like my main goal was just to sort of like play at a high level, help my team win. But uh, like really my focus once I was on the, in the NFL and started sort of taking classes at MIT, my focus was to sort of like keep myself healthy, have a good career, but also really focus on math and try to sort of make sure that, you know, I uh, can have the best math career I can. Hi, I got a question. I don't think, unfortunately, we're gonna be able to ask anymore. Matilda, you're just gonna to have to put yours in the chat. Anyone else would have to do that too so that we can send those questions to Mr. Urschel and get answers and be able to share them with you when we're done. So I'm gonna turn this over to Dr. Smith and, and Ms. Adams to wrap us up. Okay, so I just wanna thank uh, Math, Math Elite for bringing us all this great information, for helping us as young people to how we're gonna think is balancing between the math and the sports and all the things that we're interested in. Your life story was so, Feeling to me, I learned a great deal and it has encouraged me. And I'm hoping that some of the people on this or most of the people were also encouraged. And I'm just going to ask everyone if we can give him a big clap as a thank you. Can we do that? Can we thank him that way? Thank you so much for your time. Adams, I don't know what, uh, what the next step is for tomorrow. It's not for tomorrow for this group. When they next meet. Sorry, your, phone, your computer was breaking up. Yep, that's it for us this week. And once again, great questions, everyone. I loved all of the questions that was asked. This was a great discussion. We really appreciate um, Dr. Urschel, is he the one? Um, joining us and telling us his life story. So I hope you all enjoyed it. I hope you had a good time and I hope you learned some things and you can email me any more questions you have for him and I will make sure I get back to you with those answers. So thank you all and we will see you next time. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Cheryl and Caleb. Okay, I, I have a 6.30, so okay. I'm going to talk to you next time. Talk Thank you, you so later. much, Ms. Okay. Adams. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.